a formerly incarcerated Californian. I have been free from prisons and jails going on 10 years now, and I am honored to do this work, and I am excited to be able to bring this important knowledge to the community. This is very important to me. Um, so yeah, yeah, with that, let me go ahead and get my screen share going. Screen share, I'm gonna go here. And then I'll go to present. So um, today, employment rights for people with conviction histories. Um, I usually do this in partnership with, excuse me, in conjunction with Stacy. Uh, we usually do this as a team, but unfortunately she won't be able to join us today. So that's who you also see up there. And today what we are gonna talk about specifically is the California Fair Chance and Employment Act. <clears throat> um, this law is a product of organizing and it's really done by all of us and none in partnership with the host of you know community friends and, and advocates that really helped us to drive this this idea into law that it is today this is almost 20 years of work of organizing a dedication of relationship building you know at the state level and also across this country um banner box laws has um, is now in over 150 municipalities spanning at least 35 states. So, and that's at, at various different levels, whether it's at the state level and local ordinances and, and th through housing as well. So this has definitely been a long fight, a long push, and we are excited where we at today with this. The California Fair Chance Act. This was established and went into law in 2018. So we are coming up on three years, three and a half years now. And what this law did was it created three parts. With a criminal record to have, you know, a fair chance in employment. So the first part is gonna be banning the box. And that's where you get the ban a box term from. You'll hear me refer to it as ban a box instead of the fair chance act. And really there's no difference. The difference to me is like I explained it, ban a box is the movement piece to what all of us and none has created and started doing this work as far as formerly incarcerated people being in a position to stand up for themselves and demand access to various different rights. So ban a box is the movement piece. And the fair chance part, that's just the policies that come out of the movement piece. So that's the relationship I like to spell out to folks. So ban a box, it cannot ask about a criminal history before a contingent job offer is made. And we'll take a look at what that means. It also created a fair chance process. That is a notice and an opportunity to respond. We'll take a look at that as well. And what it also did was establish certain information that's off limits. And that's criminal histories that cannot be considered at all, even if employers do get access to that information. Okay, so ban the box piece. Um, <clears throat> so like we said, they are not allowed to run, they're not allowed to ask on the application and throughout the interview process. And that's most employers, okay? They cannot ask about your conviction history and they cannot run that background check on you before they offer you a job offer. And it's gonna be worded like a contingent upon a job offer or contingent upon a background check. That's when they can get your permission to go ahead and authorize that background check on you. So Bad and Box cover you through the application and the interview stage of the law. Um, and as you can see right here, how it's worded, just all kind of different ways on a various different applications. And I have to say, yes, the law is three years old now, three plus years old now. Yes, we do still see this violation on some job applications. Okay, folks, yes, we do still see it. Okay, here's a quick pop quiz. So we'll have one or two of these throughout the presentation. Um, and you guys just go ahead and put your answers in the chat, okay? Um, and you, as you can see the question up there, 
um, when can a potential employer ask about a criminal record? And this will be based off what you think you may have already know about fair chance laws and also what we're covering up until this point. Um, so go ahead and put your answers in the chat, A, B, C, or D. I can't see the chat right now because I got my screen on full. But for folks that put D after offering someone a job, you are correct. Remember, they cannot run that background check on you until they offer you a job or ask about your criminal record. Okay, the fair chance process. So what is the fair chance process? Um, so it includes several different components. And the first component is gonna be the individual evaluation. And so the fair chance process is initiated once you give that employer permission to run that background check. That's, and let's say they find something, they run a seven year background check and they find that I have, um, you know, some robbery and gun possession convictions. That's when a fair chance process gets triggered. So now they can, they cannot just throw my application away or automatically deny me because you found some robbery and some, uh, um, you know, possession of whatever it was, a gun, a drugs, whatever. Now that company must look at me as an individual and evaluate, you know, one, whether my specific convictions are directly related to the job duties of which I'm applying for. And also how much time has passed since those convictions, you know? So again, whether the specific convictions are directly related to the job and how much time has passed. So they found some robbery and gun possession charges that was five years old, okay? And they have to look to see, well, Katie's applying for a forklift operating position. There's not really a direct correlation there. You know what I'm saying? So they have to look that up. And then how much time has passed? Well, it's been five years. I've been home. I've been working. I've been, you know, doing all these great things in the community. I haven't been in any trouble. That was five years ago. That's neck, that's 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 pretty close to irrelevant, you know, five years later. So that's the first part. The second part is the initial written notification. So let's say go ahead and do the evaluation and look at all that stuff and they decide that they want to take the job offer back. They must then identify the specific convictions that they have a problem with and they'll and they must also provide you with a copy of the background check that they received and what they used to make their evaluation. And so identify the specific conviction. So again, what convictions are you concerned about? If I'm applying for the forklift job, you see the robbery and the gun possession, which one of those convictions is disqualifying me for the job? The employer has to point that out. Respond. Now I have an opportunity to respond. Um, it's a minimum of five business days to respond and be told that the response can include evidence of a background check errors, rehabilitation and circumstances of crimes and current things in your life. So this is my opportunity to talk to the lawyer and say, hey, look, you know, I see what you guys found. Again, that was five years ago. I've been working in a community at that time in my life. I was whatever it was. I had a, a, a substance abuse problem. I may have been poured down on my luck in a desperate situation. You know, this is your time to respond and take responsibility and show that you have moved on. Okay, so that respond piece is really, really important um, for folks like me that's in opposition looking for a job. Okay, next is the reevaluation. So after I respond with, with, rehabil with evidence of rehabilitation, talking about those mitigating circumstances, now that company must reevaluate me with the new information. They must say, well, hey, Katie has been home for five years. You know, she has been working. We don't see anything else. They have to, they have to take this stuff into consideration. And then if they want to go ahead and still take that offer back, they must provide me with another final written notice explaining to me the final decision and my rights to file a complaint with the government about their decision. And we'll take a look at who is in charge of fielding those complaints as well. Okay. And for your preliminary notice. So we talked about that employer sending that initial notice. 
it'll look something like this. The parts that's highlighted in yellow is really the, the, the guts of what this preliminary notice should be telling you that you have five business days to respond to this company. You know, you may include information of act, inaccuracies in your criminal arrestor. Again, we talked about showing rehabilitation, the mitigating circumstances. Um, and it must also include that notice must include that copy. We talked about that of their report. And the notice, um, you know, should give you examples of what you can include to respond. Um, and so most won't, you know, not most won't, they look all kind of ways, but this is just an example of what you want to be looking out for as you're corresponding with that potential employer. Off limits information. Okay. Um, this is the last piece. So, you know, here in, in the state of California, you know, we have, there's a lot of work going on with the criminal justice reform stuff. I think most folks are familiar with Prop 47, where, you know, the voters said, yes, we want to allow people to get their records cleaned up. We want to allow people to go to through expungement clinics and, and get things off their records, serve diversion programs and all that kind of stuff. So what this law did was officially legally establish once you have went through these diversion programs and expungement clinics and stuff like that, that information is now off limits. Even if it does show up somewhere somehow, employers are not supposed to be taking that stuff into consideration. And some of that stuff is arrests that did not result in convictions unless you have an open case. So if you're out on bail right now, then yeah, an employer can take that into consideration. Pre-trial and post-trial diversion programs Okay, a lot of folks are familiar with those. Um, Project 20, you know, there's all kind of pro pro programs out there where you can go through a diversion program. Judicially dismiss convictions. Again, you went through a clean slate clinic. You got some stuff dismissed off your record. Certificates of rehabilitation. You know, you applied to the state for that thing. That's a great thing. Um, Judicially sealed convictions, that's the same thing as dismissed in certain situations. Pardons, you know, if you had a pardon, of course, everybody's going to know about that. Juvenile court history has been off limits. You know, that's juvenile record. That stuff is supposed to be sealed um, at the age of 18. Um, I love this one. Minor marijuana convictions. That's more than two years old. Um, our folks at Call for America has a great marijuana expungement tool that is definitely a resource and is available for everyone to take advantage of to get your record cleared up. And in San Francisco, they have a, a local ordinance that's a tad bit stronger than what the state has. Uh, and that's any conviction that's more than seven years old, unless the position being considered supervised minors, dependent adults, um, or, or, or folks with disabilities. And that's going to be a common theme when it comes to the vulnerable population. So yes, that stuff is off limits, you know, and that's very important because I know for me personally, it took a year for me to go through the whole clean slate process. I had to um, put in the paperwork to get some stuff reclassified. And then once I got that stuff reclassified from a felony to a misdemeanor, I then turned around to put in the next step was to get those misdemeanors expunged or dismissed off the records. And so that took me a year. Um, for some folks, it's not free. Um, there are a lot of free expungement clinics you can find nowadays. They're they're picking up, they're all over the place. Um, but yeah, so after a year and spending money and doing all this stuff, it's very important that, that the law recognizes that that information is off limits now. Okay, here's another pop quiz. Okay, folks, get your chats ready. All right, you guys see the question? Can an employer run a background check on me? Yes or no? Go ahead and put your answer in the chat. Put yes if you think it's yes, no if you think it's no. Yes, but only after a job offer has been made. Okay, second question. Can an employer ask me about pass arrest. Yes or no? Put your answer in the chat. No. Unless the case is currently open. Remember I said if you're out on bail right now, then yes, an employer can ask about that. Can an employer ask me about dismissed convictions? 
Yes or no? What are we thinking? No. That stuff is off limits information now. Um, so this right here is just more information to make sure that you know you 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 know your rights and you're understanding what what's going on, okay? So remember, first we got the banner box piece. What's the box? The box is the, the box on that job application that asks whether you've been convicted. Most employers cannot ask that question throughout the application and interview process. The fair chance process sets up a system where you can communicate with an employer and talk about if you, whatever they may have have a problem with in your background. And that's where you're getting that fair chance at a right to work. Any off limits information. You know, it's very important for folks to seek out expungement clinics and clean slate clinics and, and take that to, to process to get your records cleared up. There's a lot of laws and stuff changing right now. Um, there's automatic clearance laws. There's new laws going working its way through the legislation now to even speed up those automatic clearances and, 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 and set up systems where DAs are on a proactive track to get these books um, cleared up and allow people to be able to access this stuff. So that stuff is very critical. Oh, hold on. Uh, thing ain't switching. Okay, so navigating the fair chance process. We're just going to spend a couple of time, minutes talking about that part when, when you're responding to an employer notice that they may be trying to take that job back. So we're going to spend some time and look at how to respond, what to do, who to talk to. The most important thing that um, I want to stress and any other folks that you come in contact with that's helping you get your life back on track is to get ready now. And when you sign up and attend Know Your Rights training such as this one, there's other one, Checker does them, uh, our folks at ARC does them. You want That's all a part of getting ready now. We're teaching you how to do this stuff now. Crafting your personal statement. We'll take a look at your personal statement. That's that part when you're telling the employer, hey, look, back in 2012, I was homeless. You know what I'm saying? And unfortunately, I made some bad decisions. And, and, and since then, I've been able to, you know, take X, Y, and Z steps to do this, that, and the other, and blah, 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 blah. So we'll take a look at how to draft the personal statement. Letters of support. What's a letter of support? Where to get it from? How it could look? And criminal court documents, such as your background check and things like that. Okay, getting a copy of your records. This is going to be super important. That way, you kind of know what you got going on, you know what I'm saying? What you can be able to take steps towards and work towards getting dismissed and record cleared up and stuff like that. You want to also just kind of maybe be ahead of the game when it comes to what an employer may be looking at. It's not going to be a rap sheet, okay? It's going to be that background check that they receive from those third-party companies. Those are two different things. You can always request a copy of your own records from the state. Okay, Xavier Becerra is no longer our attorney general. As you all know, he has been tapped for a federal position. Um, we have Rob Bonta coming in now, you know. So you want to go ahead and go on this website to request your own records. A background check. A background check is what the employer will be looking at to make their decision. And that's why it's important for you to ask for a copy because you want to be looking out for errors. If you can get a free background report from these employers in the state of California, when they, when you authorize that employer to run that background check, there's also another box that says, would you like a copy of this report? And in the state of California, it is free. So every company that runs a background check on you, you check that box, it's free every time for you to also receive a copy. So you can be able to see exactly what they're looking at. And you definitely wanna be looking for errors, right? That's gonna be one of your main line of defense when we're talking about these background check reports. They're using third party companies. They're getting this information off Google, who knows where else, you know, some unregulated internet business. And they're often wrong. You know, sometimes they're incomplete if they're ran on in, in rainiest days. You know, if you're supposed to be running a seven-year background check, maybe you ran an eight-year background check. 
that's wrong and that's incomplete and that's violation. So you wanna know what you're looking for in these background checks. Rehabilitation, evidence of rehabilitation. You wanna include any and everything that you can. I'm serious, I'm serious. I'm never gonna sell myself short when it comes to what I wanna include as evidence of rehabilitation, okay? A right to work, ready to work boot camp certificate, you taking any type of job readiness training programs. Code Tenderloin has some fantastic ones. The library has fantastic resources that they can help folks out with. We have an anger management certificate right there. Absolutely, your high school diploma. Yes, that shows that you're continuing your personal enrichment for yourself, personal, professional development. Community service volunteer, absolutely. That shows that you are a team player and you're willing to go above and beyond for the community, not just yourself, okay? Residential drug treatment drug programs, absolutely. Again, back in 2012, I might have was homeless. I may have had a substance abuse problem. Since then, I have graduated from whatever the programs I was in. I'm going to AA, and that's no longer a problem in my life. You know what I'm saying? That These are things that you want to include when it comes to responding to an employer. I know it sounds scary. It sounds like we're putting our business all out there. No. On the contrary, I'm stepping up for myself and speaking up for myself because the business is already out there, okay? When they run these third-party background check companies, the information is all over the place. It's out of control. So you're stepping up for yourself and you're speaking up for yourself. Absolutely, never selling ourselves short. A personal statement. What could the personal statement look like? You know what I'm saying? It could be a little intimidating. You want to... You know, you, you, you're you talking to somebody about a very vulnerable, you know, scary moment that has in our lives that has been used against us, you know, to shame us or whatever. So when you're trying to step up and defend yourself and talk about, you know, a situation, it's hard to know how to start to put the language together to do this. You know what I'm saying? And so that's why we came up with a template. You know, you want to discuss the conviction just the facts, briefly, what and when. You want to immediately take responsibility, show remorse in your letter. You want to talk about mitigating factors, what the situation has taught me. Discuss your accomplishments. We just talked about that. Social and community ties. Programs completed inside and outside. Employment and education is going to be important, okay? Again, you want to always be able to represent and show what you've been doing and show that you're a team player. And you want to close with relatable skills, restate your quality, share values and relevant work skills, commitment to work and family, etc. through community service, personal strengths, and let them know why you're a good candidate. And let them know that your back, there's nothing in your background that will prevent you from being a star player at this company, whatever that company is, folks. And we're going to take a quick look at a small sample letter right here. And again, when we just talked about the template, we got the three little sections. We ain't talking about a no three-page essay. That's not what we're talking about. We talk about something real quick, a small little paragraph that you're going to attach with your little packet of your certificates, okay? No one's going to be telling their life story here with no three, four pages. That is not what we got going on. We're going to have something short, just like right here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll just breeze through it a little. You know, from the time I was 18 until I was 25, I struggled with some, I struggled with drugs. Um, that I regret that period of my life. You know, after my most recent conviction in 2014, I entered the residential pro program for 18 months. I successfully completed that, proud to say that I have not used drugs for the past five years. Obtained my high school diploma and now volunteer at an organization that mentors people who was in similar situations. I love this, that's short, sweet, simple to the point. Here's another one. In 2012, I was convicted of Grand Theft Auto. Did three years in prison. During that time, I realized that I had a overcome urge for instant gratification. Real, I took some time for self-reflection, self-improvement, and now I'm out here taking all the available classes for computers and engineering. And I just love how he ended with, I've worked for the past 18 months as a mechanic and I was promoted after year of hard work and I'm excited about this opportunity to work for you. Again, when we talk about that template, 
what happened, discuss the accomplishments, close with the relatable skills. We not talking about no three page paragraph. We talk about something short, sweet, to the point. You know what I'm saying? No one wants to be dragging themselves through old trauma again. Short, sweet, to the point. These are some sample letters. When we talked about getting letters from, <clears throat> letters of support. These are gonna be in our toolkit that we will also share with um, the library folks to help send that around to our participants that has joined us today. Um, this is a hands-on toolkit that we developed that we think is critical. It's interactive. You can download it online. For folks that want a physical copy, we can have those mailed to you. We can have it mailed to the library. They can be picked up there. Um, but this is a sample support letter that, you know, hey, you can go ask from your probation and parole officer. Yes, I did ask my PO when I was going through my clean slate clinic to for a letter. And I want to mention that too. All this stuff we're talking about, the, the letters of support and getting ready now and evidence rehabilitation. Not only do you want to use that when you're applying for jobs and responding to employers, this is the same transferable information that you can use when you're applying to your clean slate clinics, when you're going for record expungement, when you're going for promotions, you may be going for a professional license on a professional note. I mean, on a personal note, I'm always open to sharing my personal struggles. Still today, I apply for a tweet card. I hold a commercial driver's license. And a tweet card, for anyone that's not familiar, really quick, it's a transportation workers identification card that will allow me to enter like sensitive areas if I was doing deliveries like the ports, airports, if I had to deliver critical supplies to like a military base. Um, and so you need to have a special clearance for that. I was recently denied that I have been home and going through all my clean slate clinics. It's been 10 years now, folks, and I'm still being denied opportunities. And you know what I did? The same packet that I used for my original Clean Slate Clinic in 2017, I pulled that same information out, wrote a template letter, and sent all that stuff in as a as when I responded to the tweet card. I got a um, preliminary denial. I already had this packet together. All I did was pull that stuff right off my wall, typed up the letter, photocopied it, and sent that back in. This is critical the stuff we talking about now. This is not just for jobs. Like I said, this is for promotions, professional licenses. Um, you may be applying to run for office somewhere. Yes, I said it, run for office somewhere. We're eligible and we're qualified for that too. We've worked hard. So these template letters and support letters, it really becomes vital even as we move on and continue to progress in our lives. A letter from a healthcare provider. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? These are templates that you can just, you know, have somebody plug in, you know, their name and title and stuff like that. It makes it easier. One more. Support letters from service providers, job training, education, volunteering. This is a template letter for that type of stuff. This is all our toolkit to help make it easier for you to pursue your clean slate clinics to help you respond to an employer within that five days. That's another thing about getting this stuff ready ahead of time. Man, you only got five days to respond to these employers. I can really barely get through my emails in five days, let alone trying to get folks to write these letters and go print it out somewhere in PDFs and all that stuff. So Getting ready now and having a ready-made package, I'm telling y'all, it's so critical. When I got that tweet card denial, I was able to turn that right around in one day and, and get my stuff submitted in for my uh, response. So I, I, I use my personal example to say I still use my same packet, not only for jobs, for everything. It's very important. Okay, common, um, common violations. Yes, three and a half years later, folks. Unfortunately, these things are still happening. And that's why it's important for not only us at Legal Aid at work, for everybody that's doing this work to help educate, whether it's Root and Rebound. I hope folks is familiar with Root and Rebound. I love them. They the bomb. Um, East Bay Community Law Center, you want to get with them for your clean slate clinics. They're the bomb. You know, everybody that's doing this work. That's why it's important for us to get the word out there and educate people on how to navigate the process, what to look for, because it is the law is still being violated. 
And some of the main ones are going to be asking about convictions on job application. I mentioned that earlier. Yes, we do still see it, folks. Conducting a background check before the conditional job offer is made. Employers do still, I want to say, make that mistake. I'm giving the benefit of the doubt. Stating that no individuals with convictions will be hired. You do still see that language on Craigslist. And I don't know about LinkedIn and stuff because I don't use that stuff. Considering off-limits information like convictions that have been dismissed. Unfortunately, folks are human. You might be dealing with a regular old Karen or a Becky that works in HR. They have no training on the law. So when they see a, a third party then release some off-limits information illegally, Karen or Becky going to still judge that information because they have not been through an employer-facing training like this. We do employer-facing trainings like this. Checker, folks are familiar with Checker. They're a background check company. That's my folks. We love them over there. They're really heavy in trying to educate employers on the importance of this law. You know, why folks like us on an employee, on an employee, employee rights, because we're a worker rights organization, we're doing our part in helping, uh, you know, job applicants understand. Um, <clears throat> wrong process or no process at all for telling applicants that they're taking the job back. So the second piece, we call that ghosting. I've been ghosted before. I was applying for a weed delivery company to drive. Um, once they got a copy of my background, they ghosted me. I never heard from them again. And also it was an incomplete background check as well. And yeah, I never heard from them again. So I've been through that. The employer does not provide a copy of the background check. A lot of people miss that step, you know. And giving the applicant less than five business days to review and respond. Um, so that means you will get an email Monday saying, hey, Ms. Dixon, uh, you know, we flagged your record for, what, what did I say earlier? Some robbery and uh, dr gun possession. We flagged your record. Well, I'll get that email Monday. And then Wednesday, I'll get the final decision saying, hey, we're going to take this back. That's less than five business days. That's against the law. So you want to be looking out for all that stuff, folks. Okay, it's very important to document these potential violations. Right now, you know, everything is digital. Everything is online. So it makes it really easy to document this stuff. You want to be taking screenshots, photos. You want to be scanning stuff. You know, if you're using a... Um, what, what, what am I looking for here? A, a, a one-stop shop. If you're at like a career center, you want to make sure that if you, you know, not only are you putting whatever their little return scan or fax address your own. So you want to scan stuff to your personal email as well. Um, you know, the emails are easy to save these days. You can star them. You can create a personal folder for communication with these different employers. Another thing, take note of the type of communications who did you talk to? Was it Karen or Becky at HR? Was it a phone call? What date and what time? Was it all primarily through email? Did it seem like it was an automated response? Take notes of the type of communication because that can prove to be critical. Again, maybe Karen and Becky is telling you, oh, we don't hire felons when that's not even company policy. That's just Karen or Becky not understanding company policy. Okay, last but not least, hold on, let me get some more. <clears throat> Excuse me, folks. So standing up for your rights, last but not least. Excuse me. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Clean slate programs, get your records, draft letters. We just talked about all that stuff. Document what's happening. We just talked about all that stuff. Respond to the employer. That's very critical. We talked about what that response could look like. Filing a complaint with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. That's the state agency that's tasked with fielding, <coughs> excuse me, fielding these complaints and responses. And turn it to your community. Like all of us are none, like I mentioned, root and rebound. East Bay Community Law Center, Legal Way at Work. That's going to be critical when it comes to standing up for your rights. Um, <clears throat> we don't really have, let me see, what time is it? No, we don't really have too much time for the role play. 
but that's okay. That's okay. Um, one thing I want people to know, you know, if a potential employer asks about your criminal history on the application, be truthful. You know, there's no way, one right way to answer these questions or not only on the application, let's say if during the interview process and it seemed like it's going good and an employer asks, is there anything that they may know about? There's no one right way to answer this question. Be truthful. But here are some things to think about. You know, if an employer later runs a background check on you and you said no or lied or something like that, that can come back to bite you. But know your rights. You don't have to tell them everything. You know, and for most and for most parts, this is probably an illegal question. So folks have come up with some crafty ways to respond to this potential question. You know what I'm saying? You know, if you're in an interview and they ask, you know, you let them know, hey, um, isn't there a new law that just passed that says that that question has to wait until after an offer is made? There's all kind of ways to answer that question without getting caught up and feeling insecure and stumbling all over your words and stuff like that. So be truthful, but know your rights. And going through a training like this will help with that. Um, read the question carefully. You know, when you're when you're when you're filling out and apply for a job, what does it say? Have you ever been convicted in the last seven years? Have you ever been convicted in the last three years? Have you know, read the question carefully and that'll help you really figure out how you should answer it. Think about your conviction history. You know, always remember you have options. Take legal action. And on the second page right here, I just want to say practice, practice 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 your responses when i first came home when i got out of the lancy street <clears throat> yes i was standing in the mirror practicing my responses when i feel like i was going um you know if i was this my second interview i really want this job yes i was in the mirror practicing my responses of what i would say if i would get asked certain questions because i really want this job and I really want to, you know, make sure I'm prepared for what could happen. So there's nothing wrong with that. And take it serious. And there's all kinds of support groups out here that help folks with the job skills and the job training. Some of this stuff, if you're if, if you're dealing with the right career center, they'll have practice sessions for you. This is kind of what the intake form looks like when you want to report a violation um, about an employer who you think may have violated your rights. It's really not a hard form. It says it's 11 pages, but really only the first three pages are all you need to fill out. All that other information is uh, optional. Now, we like to tell people to stand up for their rights because absolutely it's important, but we wanna let folks know some of the potential benefits of standing up for your rights. Um, so not only are you going to be standing up for your rights, you can hold that employer accountable. You know, you may get an explanation of why you didn't get that job back. I mean, why you didn't get that job. And that will help you prepare as you go forward and move on to the next uh, potential employer you want to apply to and, and speak with and engage with. You can't possibly get that job back. I know, I know a lot of folks that has stood up for their rights and said, hey, man, you know, I've, I've been doing this, that, and the other, and employers have said well you, yeah you're right you know you have been and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll give you a chance you know so definitely you can get that job back back pay and other monetary compensation depends on what the situation is again you're going for a promotion and you've been denied a promotion for a year because of your background you never know what kind of back pay or monetary compensation can be there change the company practice you know you could have, you could change this company mandate training for those Karens and Beckys that work in HR that don't really know what's going on here in the state of California and the times and, and laws have changed when it comes to how to read and process someone's criminal background. Um, so yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Those are some of the potential benefits of, you know, following with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. Record clearing resources. I spoke about some of this stuff throughout the presentation. Um, <clears throat> your local public defender office, I know for me, at the time it was definitely San Francisco. So sfpublicdefender.org.services, that's why I did my clean slate process 
it was really effortless. Other than me having to chase folks down to get the letters, that's really what took the longest. And then the court dates being spread out. But other than that, it was really effortless. I went through a clean slate clinic that was in partnership with the CAS. San Francisco Public Defense Department provided access to, you know, public defenders to kind of look at your case, tell you what you can do. They had um, the live scan already there. And then they did the rest of the work. The public defenders took that packet of paperwork and processed it. So absolutely, you want to try San Francisco Public Defender. Those were my favorite. I mentioned Ruben Rebound several times throughout this. Love, love, love them. They hold clean slate clinics pretty often now. They have clean slate helplines, hotlines, all kind of stuff, folks. I just cannot under speak the great work Ruben Rebound does. Clearmyrecord.org, that's my folks that I that I mentioned earlier, Cold for America. That's their clear my record option for the marijuana convictions. They have a great program that actually was piloted out of San Francisco when they had um, DA Gascon in there. And, you know, it was really groundbreaking at the time to really allow San Francisco to proactively look at old marijuana related convictions and proactively get the ones that is eligible to be you know, reclassified now that marijuana has been made recreational. So um, clearmyrecord.org, that is a fantastic record clearing resource. Um, and that is, again, done by my folks, uh, Code for America. I just love, love, love those people. Uh, and Legal Aid at Work, that's us. Uh, that's me and Stacy. You know, you want to look at your perspective area like we have a small map there because we do do statewide work. So, you know, if you're in the Oakland Bay area, you know, or San Francisco, you want to, you know, just find your region and we do employment rights. So if you feel you've been discriminated against the job because of your background, but we do other services to wage theft. If you feel you've been being underpaid, you know, we do, um, <clears throat> we do a lot of work. Okay, here's some more resources again. So the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing, that's gonna be the state agency that's tasked with, um, you know, fielding these complaints. Goodwill SF, they do a lot of work as far as employment related services, same thing as the library. You, go, you know, they have a lot of work options and, and career training programs that you can become involved with. I've mentioned Rule Read by several times. All of us are none. Um, I'm proud to be a member of All of Us Are None. That's at prisonerswithchildren.org. They do a fantastic year-long policy fellowship for formerly incarcerated people like myself. It's paid, it's full-time with benefits, vacation, everything. And it's a real intense 12-month program to really teach you public policy at the state level with the criminal justice reform focus. And it really changed my life, folks. Um, and it really opened up a, 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 a different path for me. And that's really how I got to where I am today, to be able to be on not just a statewide platform, a nationwide platform. I've been invited to do these presentations and speak and weigh in on policies and all kind of stuff because of some of the things that all of us are none exposed me to. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of us get boggled down with thinking we're not worthy. We can't, we're, you know, we, we can't hold up in certain arenas and stuff like that. I used to think all that stuff too. That stuff is just not true. All you got to do is tap in with your community, learn about these fantastic resources and take advantage of them. That's really all you got to do. Your life will be changed in a year or two. I promise. I've seen it happen. Again, we got the San Francisco Public Library Reentry website. You guys know we got y'all on there. We love you guys. I love the San Francisco Public Library. Um, <clears throat> out there looking for work and I needed to keep my resumes and stuff updated, looking for jobs. That's where I would go. You know what I'm saying? When I was out there homeless, looking for resources, I needed somewhere to charge my phone to get off my feet. I would go to the library. I love the San Francisco Public Library. They do a lot 
for reentry folks and you could be re-entering to whatever level of society again it doesn't have to be from prisons and jails it could be from homelessness that's a real community out there that really face a lot of discrimination i was homeless a lot of folks don't want to give you a job if you don't have a real address so i love the san francisco public library and they just hold it down you know what i'm saying they they, they do it all and i just i can't undercut the library at all I really appreciate it and now to be able to do these presentations in partnership with a library you guys this just mean the world to me i'm serious and i'm here to support anybody that need any help to find opportunities or whatever it is you want to do it don't have to be public policy you want to get your commercial license i'll help you figure out what's the best pathway for free for free we don't want you paying them driving schools five ten thousand dollars that stuff takes six seven months we don't got time for that. We're going to find something different. You know, they have my folks at the crop organization. I'm sorry, they're not up here, but they have a new program that they just started, you know, that they're, they're taking 18 people. They're giving thousand dollar a month stipends. They're providing you with a laptop and they're also providing you with hands on technical training, skilling folks up to go after these tech careers, these code careers and all that kind of great old stuff, tech sales, whatever it is you want to do. I know folks are familiar with code tenderloin. I love what they're doing, teaching formal incarcerated people how to be coders. Um, my girl Shelly Winter that work my that work for Microsoft now, she's a top salesman, she's a top saleswoman over there. So the the the, the options for us folks it's, there's no moments these days and i want to encourage everybody to shoot 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 for shoot for gold shoot for the stars because we can do this um and that's the end of the presentation folks um <clears throat> sorry i just i always like to end it with these you know little sermons because for real man we it's a lot of stuff that we talk ourselves out of we don't know how to get there we don't know how to make a career change we so scared we caught up thinking, you know, one thing and this, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot of good stuff going on right now in the state of California for formerly incarcerated people. And I want to help all, all of us find whatever is next and best for us. So with that is the end of the presentation. We definitely wanted to leave some Q and A. So I'll just go ahead and uh, stop my little screen share. And yeah, we got any questions, folks, if there's, you know,